Now we're going to begin our discussion of learning and memory. And usually when I teach this, I like to begin with a discussion. What are the major types of memory? What do you think of when you think of memory? What, what are the kinds of uh, phenomena that you associate with memory? And then we have a really nice discussion where everybody comes up with lots of great ideas. So please use this moment to think about what kind of uh, memory comes to mind. You could pause the video and just think about it. It's good to generate ideas before you hear the answer. That is known as the testing effect. Uh, the generation effect is another kind of version of the same idea. And it improves your memory and learning. Okay, so here's two major forms of memory. When you take a intro psychology class, these are not the two forms of memory that people typically pr describe. Uh, I know because I teach also intro psychology and these don't even show up in the textbook. The two forms we identify are activation-based memory and synaptic weight change-based memory. So over here on the left, we have our diagram of uh, neurons spiking away. And as long as those neurons continue to spike and fire their action potentials, there's a kind of memory trace there, okay? So neurons, again, are encoding through the distributed pattern of activity of your neurons across your brain, um, this whole uh, kind of content representation of what it is you're thinking about, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, all those different pieces are all there in terms of neurons firing. And as long as those neurons continue to fire, you're, you've got that active kind of knowledge representation in your brain, right? Um, and so that's a kind of memory. But obviously, when that firing stops, the memory goes away, that form of the memory goes away, right? And so in that sense, um, it's kind of fluid, it's active. Uh, but it's also transient. When people talk about, you know, the phenomenology of memory, uh, this kind of residual activity, this leftover activity, this activity that persists over time, is definitely one category of things that we'll see is very often discussed. The other neural mechanism at the, at the basic level that can support memory is changes in synaptic weights. And really, this is kind of more proper memory in some sense. It's long-term memory, it's long-lasting memory. And you remember when we talked about uh, long-term potentiation back in the learning chapter, uh, one of the reasons people were so excited about the long-term nature of this potentiation is that it could provide a neural basis for memory, right? So people were looking and knowing that, of course, memories last a long time. And so you need some neural signature that lasts a long time. And there you have it, this potentiation uh, increase in AMPA receptors that changes the overall strength of the synaptic connections among neurons. And again, this it really is the fundamental basis of most kind of long-term memory in the brain, long-lasting memory. These two forms of memory provide a nice kind of complementary set of mechanisms, you know, long-lasting changes versus transient, uh, really a complementary set of uh, tr uh, benefits and costs in terms of uh, the nature of these memory systems as well. So in summary, uh, the two forms of memory, again, weight-based has this long-lasting uh, ability to persist over lots of intervening time periods. Um, the other thing we didn't talk about is the high capacity nature of uh, synaptic weight-based memory. Um, and so uh, because you have so many synapses, 10,000 synapses per neuron, billions of neurons, um, it sort of you know makes sense that this memory system has essentially an unlimited amount of capacity for all practical purposes. Um, nobody's ever actually gotten to the point where they can't learn another thing. You know, their brain, your brain actually doesn't just fill up. Um, you can always change and uh, adapt your neural representations to encode more information. And then activation-based memory, of course, has very low capacity, it turns out, um, or at least in terms of if you want to access that information once you start uh, kind of thinking about some particular aspect of what you're, what's in your brain, uh, it's kind of like the uh, quantum physics. Once you start to observe that system and think about that system, you disrupt it, so you can lose track of that that memory once you begin to think about it. So it's it's easily lost, it's transient, but it's also very flexible. And so one of the things you can do with with 
activation-based memories kind of juggle a lot of information more dynamically in that introductory psychology textbooks and classes. This is the picture of memory that everybody learns about and talks about. It's known as the modal model of memory. Uh, it was really summarized by Atkinson and Schifrin in a very important paper in the 70s and maybe it was the 60s. This captures kind of the elements that were common among many different specific models of memory that were coming out in the early days of the cognitive revolution when we started talking about representations inside the brain. Simple, simple aspect of this model is that it has nice, you know, kind of three components uh, that flow directly from one to the other, and uh, it's very kind of sensible and easy to understand. It fits with what we intuitively understand about our memory systems. So you have some kind of, you know, sensory input, then you have sensory memory, which is the short-term trace of that immediate sensory input. And so in terms of what we think about when we think about memory and those mechanisms we just talked about, um, this is really just activity, residual activity in the very areas that are doing the sensory processing. Okay, so if you have a visual image coming in and um, you see that image, neurons in your visual cortex are gonna be active and those again will continue to be active even after the image disappears and so this iconic trace, as they call it, of that uh, visual image, is just those neurons kind of continuing to fire away for a little bit, uh, several hundred milliseconds um, after the image has disappeared. And uh, interestingly, as you don't attend to various aspects of that image, um, we have this kind of loss uh, portion of the curve here where information disappears from uh, these, each of these memory systems. So unattended information is lost. Uh, then you have, if you do pay attention to some aspect of your very uh, high dimensional sensory me memory, and so one aspect that we know about the visual system is you're processing a lot of information in your visual system, um, all the different modalities, and you know, just even within vision, it's very, very high dimensional. And you can only really kind of encode and pay attention to uh, a very sh small amount of that uh, large signal to encode it at higher levels in your brain where uh, this kind of next stage is, is thought to exist, which is this short-term memory system. Um, and again, this, because it's described as short-term memory, fits with what we think about for these activation-based uh, mechanisms. Again, neural activity continuing to fire after the whatever it is that we're, we were attending to maybe has disappeared from our visual input we can still encode um, something about that, but at a higher level. And so the difference here is that these are higher level conceptual semantic knowledge type representations versus kind of the lower level um, kind of image of what we saw. So if you see a picture of a cat, uh, you may get that vivid kind of, you know, actual sensory kind of feeling of what the cat looks like in your sensory memory. But the notion like the concept cat, and maybe which cat it is, uh, um, that kind of higher level knowledge is encoded in your short-term memory. And some of you may have seen the famous uh, demos of the gorilla uh, walking by a group of people playing basketball. Um, if you don't pay attention to the gorilla, you don't notice the gorilla. It doesn't enter your higher level kind of infratemporal cortex areas. But if you do pay attention to the, to the gorilla, then you can obviously hold on to that memory of, wow, there was a gorilla there. So again, this is very much modulated by what you're paying attention to. Um, there is this further notion of rehearsal. So you have to uh, work to maintain those neural patterns of firing. If you don't continue to focus your attention, so it's really kind of also just the same uh, mechanism that we would encompass within the term of attention. Uh, this, this ability to kind of reactivate or focus on this same information and not go off and start thinking about other things, in which case your neurons start having different encodings. Um, so uh, rehearsal allows you to sort of maintain information in short-term memory. And any information you don't retain is, is lost out the bottom here. And then finally, uh, there's this notion of long-term memory. One of the things I don't like about this diagram is it sort of implies that short-term memory and long-term memory are two different boxes in your brain. 
and this is true in a computer uh, and so you know the RAM in your computer might be considered an analog of short-term memory in the brain uh, someplace where you're holding on to the information that you're currently processing that current kind of document that you're writing is loaded up into RAM uh, but long-term memory is pictured as this kind of vast repository or, or storehouse kind of off-site storage somewhere else who knows where um, but in fact uh, the, the, the neural way to think about this is that short-term memory is just the active portion of you know your entire cortical storehouse of knowledge is all there in your neurons in your cortex right it's not like it's somewhere else the short-term memory is really just the activated portion of your long-term memory it's not like you have this other place now it is true when we start to think about the hippocampus um, that uh, the hippocampus encodes a lot of episodic memories, events that have happened in your past. And so you could think about the hippocampus as this kind of vast storehouse of, of long-term knowledge. On the other hand, it's a very small structure, not exactly what you'd picture to be like the hard drive of your brain. Um, and it seems like it, it only encodes just the very tip of these memories, the very the very index, as people call it, um, to retrieve that memory. But really, the knowledge is out there in your cortex. That that vast warehouse is somewhere in your in your cortex itself. Overall, we think about uh, long-term memory as again being weight-based because that's what persists. This long-term potentiation, and so these are weight changes that have taken place in your cortex and in your hippocampus. Um, that have now enabled this information to be encoded in a way that you can kind of get back to and retrieve uh, later in time. And one of the main sources of loss from long-term memory is not kind of these kind of uh, attention type of things, uh, but rather uh, some kind of uh, overwriting or interference. And that's really what we're going to focus on uh, today is uh, how interference interrupts long-term memories and then how the hippocampus has mechanisms that help it fight against that interference and combat the interference.